Welcome. Okay, so today we're going to go over chapter two, Strangers from a Different Shore by Ronald Dukaki. Overblown with hope, the first wave of Asian Americans. And let me do this. And it's so exciting. All right, um, today we're going to go over chapter two. Um, chapter two. Overblown with hope, the first wave of Asian immigration. Their bur history bursts with telling. Now, Asians are the most populated, Asian Americans are the most populated in certain states, right? And Hawaii, California, and New York are basically the places that they're mostly populated. So in, a, in a, like a nutshell, the coast, they're mostly populated in the coast, right? And some of you, are taking this class in California. So then actually you have to know that actually that is where most Asians live, California, New York, and Hawaii, yes. Um, but again, there are other Asians who live in other places such as like the Midwest and the South. Um, they are uh, quite large numbers, but not as the aggregate, the largest. Uh, for instance, I was raised in the Midwest and so um, a little bit in New York a bit. So, um, Again, there's lots of Asians and in different places, but if you're in from Hawaii or New York, California, that is the most populated states. Now, where do Asian Americans live? Pause. I'd like you to answer. I just told you, but I'd like you to answer again. So in 2017, the following states have the largest Asian American populations, California, New York, Texas, New Jersey, Illinois, Washington, Florida, Virginia, Hawaii and Massachusetts. And you know, it really depends on what type of Asian American you are. And, and there's some Asian Americans such as maybe Chinese Americans who are, you know, pretty much spread out everywhere. Um, Indian Americans spread out everywhere. Maybe you can say Korean Americans, right? But some places uh, such as let's say um, the Midwest, you have Minnesota, you have a huge Hmong population. You go to New Jersey, you have a huge South Indian population, right? So it really depends on where you want to go. Uh, there's a big uh, kind of a Sri Lankan population in Florida. Washington has, you know, a plethora of different type of Asians. Um, so again, it's really interesting, right? Uh, where Asian Americans follow where they live. All right, so I would like you to pause and I want you to look up the census trends. APIs or APAs, depends on what you say, are the fastest growing ethnic group. I would like you to look up, this is very fascinating, what's the education level? Uh, is the education level of Asian Americans, is it equal to Anglo Americans or has it surpassed it or is it below it? My second question is, for Asian Americans as an aggregate, are, is the poverty level equal to Anglo Americans? Does it surpass it or is it below it? Also, in terms of social divorce life, um, in terms of Asian Americans, are they more likely to be married, more likely to be divorced? Are they equal to other groups or different, right? So take a pause, take five minutes, and we'll let you look this up. Okay, unpause, okay? If you unpause, I want you to, uh, you'll find the answers uh, to these questions I asked you. So the, 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 the way to think about Asian Americans is there's many types of Asian America. And even within one ethnic group, there's many different, uh, many different Asian Americans. So if you look up the education level of Asian Americans, actually Asian Americans have a higher rate of graduation completion than Anglo Americans, who have the highest, who have one of the highest rates of college graduation, and this has, uh, you know, a lot of some different uh, reasonings, right? One, some Asian Americans, such as Taiwanese American or South Indian American, they come already with graduate degrees, right? And so that's one out, that's like recent arrivals, I mean, post 1990s, 2000s even, right? And then another thing is that if you look at Asian Americans, um, a lot of their, uh, 
status is similar in order to stay in this country sometimes they have to keep getting degrees right now so if you look at it and that's the easy answer asian americans are the model minority they're just doing so much better in some cases you know for indian americans like 70 percent graduation right but actually if you look deeper if you disaggregate and i want you guys because you're the top six percent of the world i want you to disaggregate and i want you to look at each individual asian ethnic group Right, even within ethnic groups, right? And if you look at that, yes, uh, Indian Americans have 70%, Chinese Americans have 50%, Asian Americans are aggregate, I think have almost 50%. That's quite high, it's higher than Anglo-Americans. But if you look at other groups such as Southeast Asians, in particular, Hmong, Mian, Cambodia, and Laotian, you have one of the lowest graduations of college rates in the nation. You're looking at 13%, 16%. And we actually look in the deep numbers even deeper, which I do because that's my research, my passion, is to improve graduation rates for first generation minorities, but in particular, Southeast Asians. Uh, and Watkins, uh, I looked at numbers and it's actually a lot of women. Well, a lot of women are actually uh, doing better within those ethnic groups, the Southeast Asian women, right? But in general, it's still a low, uh, it's not as high graduation rate as people think of in terms of Asian Americans, it's like 13%, 13 to 16%, right? If you're looking at the census, right? American Community Survey. Um, and that's quite different from other Asian Americans, such as Indian Americans who have a 70% graduate level. But again, if you look at the numbers deeply within Indian American, that number is not actually not um, accurate as well, because there's lots of poverty, right? So yes, I, I love it when people say, yeah, you know, Southeast Asians are not doing that great. That is true. And I, I love that because you have to be very you know, vocal for your community and say, yes, we need those things. But even when you look at Chinese Americans, Indian Americans, Korean Americans, Japanese Americans, there's huge levels of poverty and actually large groups who do not go to college. So again, there's multiple Asian Americans and even within Asian America, right, there are actually um, diversity. So again, uh, poverty level. Yes, Southeast Asian Americans are uh, very much uh, on the poverty line a huge amount of, of child poverty, except ex also um, family poverty. And all Asian American groups actually have a, 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 a level of poverty, in particular Southeast Asians, but again, within East Asians as well, um, and the, the poverty is not low. In terms of divorce social life, Asian Americans are very particular. They're very unique among other ethnic groups. Um, they tend to be married. They tend to be married to their own ethnic group. And there is a very low divorce rate. And they also tend to take care of their elderly. So that's very unusual about Asian Americans, right? Very, very different. Um, you know, it's fascinating. Like, why is this such, right? Um, Asian Americans also, you know, educate themselves sometimes. They have their own SAT schools. They have their own tutoring centers. They have, you know, this is all non use with non-government money. And so a lot of teams are like, oh, we should emulate Asian Americans. And that's something to think about. All right, so again, I'm gonna talk about it over and over again, this model minority myth, right? This model minority myth has followed Asian Americans uh, for a long time and it is a terrible thing, okay? The model minority myth that says Asian Americans are smart, rich, have no problems, have no poverty. It's actually, there's a creation there. I mean, yes, it continues on the yellow peril that's been a, around for a couple hundred years. Um, uh, Edward Said wrote this book, wonderful book you should buy called Orientalism that talks about how basically Westerners or Occidentals um, called Asians Orientals and basically said that they're weird, exotic, erotic, dirty, etc. And it's been used all over in art, in their music, and their literature. So it's like really big. And, and actually Edward Said, uh, Dr. Said says, in order to find the West, they use themselves as opposite of the East. So that's, that's fighting words right there. So they're like, if the West is strong in the West, then the East gotta be weak. If the West is rational, the East has gotta be like mystical, right? So again, these are like, these things have been around for a long time. So when you look at the model minority myth, I wanna talk specifically about this myth. In 1960s, this guy right there, take a look, William Peterson, he writes this article and it's supposedly positive about Japanese Americans. And he says, you know, these Japanese Americans, they didn't have any help and they're doing great. And I don't know why these other ethnic groups such as African Americans, right, are doing so poorly since the African, since the Japanese Americans were interned, right? So you see, 
that he was using Asians as a racial wedge, using Asian Americans to defeat other groups, right? And again, this has been very, very difficult for Asian Americans. They have never called themselves model minority. They never were the metal minority. I can show you the statistics. There's not true. There's actually a high uh, dropout rate for several Southeast Asian and Asian American male and female groups. Um, and, and also uh, other, um, you know, uh, underprivileged things, right? But this persistence of the model minority is actually pushed by other people other than Asian Americans, and they use it specifically to hurt and wound other minorities. So I really want to make that clear. That is something that's used, uh, Asian Americans, and we as Asian Americans um, and others who know about this have to fight back. We got to fight back because we cannot be used as a sword, because particularly because Asian Americans and Latino Americans are primarily brought here because of the 1965 Immigration Act. So a lot of people ask me, hey, for this class, what's the one thing you want me to learn, Professor Bond? I'm like, yes, that's a good question. There is one thing I want you to learn. That's like one thing. If it's one thing, 20 years from now, I want you to learn why you're here. If you're Asian, if you're Latino, you're here because of the activism of the 1960s um, African Americans in the Civil Rights Movement. And particularly, you're here because of the 1965 Immigration Act, also known as the Heart Seller Act. Um, and that's the reason why you're here. So, and, and that was pushed by Af African Americans. And if you're thinking, oh no, I'm Southeast Asian or I'm Filipino. Actually, if you look at the studies back then, majority Americans did not want Asians to come. They did not. And there's a lot of polling that suggested that they, majority of Americans did not want Asians to come, okay? One group wanted Asian Americans, particularly Southeast Asians to come after 1965. African Americans. So don't forget this activism by African Americans to help Asian Americans to come to this country, but even to welcome them. Okay. So this is something I really want you to know. Okay. Lots of wonderful groups. If you look down at the advancing justice, um, I would love for you to like join their Twitter or their group or even volunteering. They are a coalition of Asian American lawyers who fight to dismantle white supremacy and defend black lives. Okay, so again, wonderful group, and there's other groups that you might want to join. And again, you don't have to join just one group. I'm a member of like 12 groups. So again, you know, spread yourself out and fight for yourself and fight for other groups. And don't let your name be used, be sullied by this William Peterson who calls Asians the, the model minority. Because you know, when they say that, that means you don't need any help, and your community doesn't need any help, and and you need no money, and you get and and again, you get no scholarships, and you get an, an no fi uh, financial aid, and you don't get uh, firm action. It's it's down the line. It's it's a way of defeating Asian Americans on the back end. All right. So again, this is the one thing. Please learn this. The 1965 Immigration Act or the Heart Seller Act. Who fought for it? Take a break. I want you to take a pause right here. I want you to ask. I want you to answer this. Who benefited from this 1965 Immigration Act? And what's the result? Now, you're going to learn later on that Asians were actually banned from this country. 1882, they had the Chinese Exclusion Act, and 1907, they had a gentleman's agreement, and basically in the 1920s, they had the Asiatic Exclusion Laws. So no Asian, including other ethnic groups, such as Latinos, could come to the United States, right? So how is it they're able to come? Just look ahead, this 1965 Immigration Act pushed by African Americans, okay? I want you to think about your school right now. I want to think about the food restaurants that you'd eat. Um, how different would it look if the 1965 Immigration Act was not passed, right? Because they're trying to repeal this act, right? They're trying to get rid of it. They're trying to stop immigration, right? If anyone looks at the media. What would our school, your school, look like if this never happened? Would you be in this country? I wouldn't be in this country. I would not be here. Yeah, I'd be in Asia because <laughs> I'd be banned for coming in. Okay, and I want you to start thinking about like the big picture, how they keep using these things over and over again, and, and the treatment of Asians in terms of exclusion. That one of the specific named ethnic groups excluded Asian group multiple times, right? How they're using it now for other groups, right? All right, so the first wave of Asian immigrants. So 1835, there's records of Chinese coolies. Um, 1848, uh, they're imported from who? I want you to take a, a pause. I want you to answer that. Why were they imported? And the Chinese were actually written out of history, and why? So pause. Take five minutes. Take 10 minutes. Answer that.
All right. I hope you wrote down those answers. Okay. Um, so actually in 1848, they're imported because of the gold rush, right? And also labor, right? Farm labor and all over the nation. And, and particularly for California, they came to do the railroads. Okay. So, and again, imagine what Asians did, particularly Chinese. They linked the, the, the railroad together. They kind of brought modernity to, uh, to America, but they're written out of history. They're not there. So look at this picture. This is a, a real life picture of the last day that they combined or the end of the, the railroad, right? Um, do you guys see any Chinese in that picture? Because I don't see any Chinese. And if you look at the Pacific uh, Railroad, 90% of the, I think it was like over 70% of the workers were Chinese. So that example is, is how Asian American history has been written out, right? And had, had a huge effect on America, but written out of history. Now, if you look, there's a regular working ticket. You see, it says the Chinese must go. We talked about how Asian Americans were lured into this country to do the uh, railroad. But here, there's a massive anti-Asian sentiment, particularly anti-Chinese sentiment. I'm going to say Asian a lot because Asians have always been uh, uh, dealt with and viewed as a group, right? So you might think, I'm not Chinese. It doesn't matter. Actually, it doesn't matter because when they ban the Chinese, they ban all the other Asians, right? We've had 2,000, over 2,000 COVID racist events against Asians wasn't about a specific Asian, it's all Asians. So again, that's why we always talk about how we got together as a group, okay? So if you look at this picture, it says the Chinese must go working men's party of California. So unions uh, were very much against Chinese. They, they thought that they took the jobs or they had a lower fee for jobs. Um, that was one. Carney was a, a big person in San Francisco, was very anti-Chinese. So these are the important acts I want you to write down. And I want you to pause. And 1848, the import Asian labor, right? When they started bringing in Asians. And then very crucially, you and yeah, you would be tested on this. What was the 1882 China Seclusion Act? It's when they banned ch Chinese, right? And it's really important uh, because, you know, they told them here, here to do all the work. They, they uh, did all the back-breaking uh, railroad work. And then 1907, they also banned Japanese and all the other Asians. Right, so I, these are important acts. You have to know these acts because they affect you. And these acts, uh, the past is not the past. The past is still here. All right, so gamsan means, or gamsan, uh, means gamsan means uh, uh, golden mountain. Okay, I want to recommend this this book, The Chinese and the Iron Road, uh, edited by uh, Gordon Chang and Shelley Fisher. Is it Fishkin? Fishkin. Okay. All right, so uh, it means golden mountain. So probably 1840s, 1850s, 40, uh, 46,000 Chinese departed from Guangdong, China to primarily California, yes. And 1849 to 93, another 380,000 came to where? Yes, Hawaii and California, okay. Most of the Chinese were from where? Guangdong. And why they migrate? Well, we've got, we think of the push-pull, right? Um, if we had a class discussion, we talk about poverty, um, you know, drought. Uh, these, a, a lot of these men uh, were trying to send back money, remittances to their family to support them. So really tough men and that, that uh, try to support their family and had very difficult lives in America. Now, Japanese Americans, a major voice, and I really highly recommend you read this graphic novel by George Takai called They Called Us Enemy, Great, and he has a wonderful uh, musical as well. Now, the Japanese arrived in Hawaii and began in the 1880s. The Issei are first generation, Nisei are second generation, Sansei, third generation. Okay, so now we have fourth generation Japanese Americans. Okay, I want you to look that up. Now, why did they come to the United States? Well, um, they came to the United States because, you know, Japan was not the great global power it is today. It was a lot of starvation, and they had a system of inheritance where the first son gets it all. So, you know, usually in my classes, I'll say, who's the second, third, fourth child in the class? And I get all these people raise their hand. I'll say, you get nothing. Your older, your oldest son gets everything. Are you going to stay in, stay in Japan? Because you get nothing. And pretty much everyone's like, I'm going to leave Japan. And so that's what happened. They left Japan. They came to the United States and they came to Hawaii, particularly, and in California. And funny thing, I don't 
I have students who do this thing called Tinder and uh, is it Tinder and what are these things that you swipe right on? Okay, so well, there was, there was catfishing back in the day, okay? So look no further than this poor picture bride. So, so a lot of Japanese immigration was a little bit different. They were very different from the Chinese because Chinese only men could come and uh, the women were banned. There was like a page act that wouldn't let any woman come in. So the, this is the, one of the original like catfishes. So these were Japanese picture brides. They're beautiful young girls. And then they're from good families. They tend to be females and then hair in the systems. They, you know, were not the oldest. They didn't go, the women in general don't get anything anyway. And so basically these men, these Japanese men, like let's say in the Central Valley of California, they would send them this like beautiful picture of themselves barring the suit uh, sometimes or having a younger person take a picture for them or showing a picture from themselves 20 years ago and you know finding a bride and so the the japanese woman was you know girl would woman would travel so far to meet this man and then be super surprised that this guy is like 40 middle age and he's not rich at all he's just like a worker but such as it is and he got married okay so they were stuck it was a long voyage and, and yes it was they were catfished all right so again that was huge for the japanese now for the koreans it's a very tragic life. I went to, uh, is it Dainuba? And I, I went to uh, kind of a Korean, um, Korean kind of event. And, there, and, the, and the librarian who's talking, she just could stop crying. And she talked about how the tragic, sad life that Koreans had in America, right? Uh, so we had 8,000 Koreans come to United States between 1903 and 1920. So I know I'm from LA too. So like everyone's like, oh, LA Koreans, you know, that's what being Korean or New York Korean. But actually the earliest history of Korean Americans is in the Central Valley, okay? And actually that is Korean history, uh, Korean American history. So we had no that. So actually, um, they were kind of like, and you can pause right now if you want and answer questions. How are they like the Chinese? How are they like the Japanese? How are they different? Well, sadly, they're like the, the, the Chinese in that they're all bachelor men and they didn't allow Korean women. And so it was a very terrible, uh, very sad life for them. They work very hard. And, you know, while they're working hard, their, their country got taken over by Japan. So really working hard with, you know, some Japanese uh, workers right next to them in Central Valley. So like very intense competition. Um, but, you know, they, all the money they had, they sent back to Korea, to their families. And uh, they did a lot. And you hear, you have Harry S. Kim, who was one of the creators of this, these like orchards, uh, particularly of the nectarine. Um, him and Anderson, they created um, this like new fruit kind of, and, and uh, you know, very, very successful. One of the first Korean American millionaires, right? And so really a wonderful story. I want to encourage you to watch Watch a documentary on that. So I'm going to end uh, with, I still have a few, but uh, with push pull. Okay. What pulled and pushed these early Korean, these early Asian Americans to come to the country? Like what pulled them, right? What pushed them? Okay. Uh, was it they was pushing? Uh, was it, uh, you know, lots of different factors. So take a break, write down all these things and you can write it. Okay. All right, now Manong's in the movement. These are Filipinos, okay? Filipinos came from an organization of the US. 90% of Filipinos are Catholic, why, right? Well, Spain took over uh, Philippines for a couple hundred years and so it changed their dynamic, okay? Classes in the Philippines are taught in one language, guys. English, very good, okay? And that really makes uh, Filipinos so different from other Asians in the early, particular. the other Asians, some of them were not literate and in their own language, right? So let alone English, right? But Filipinos, they can read the contracts and they, so they knew when they were being uh, mistreated and mis, uh, mispaid. And so that was very different. That's why one of the, uh, the when Cesar Chavez was fighting for Mexican American rights, he was also fighting with, uh, uh, fighting with, right? Filipino Americans who are also fighting for their uh, farmer rights as well, okay? So by 1930, some 110,000 Filipinos came, went to Hawaii. And again, I, I want you to go back and I want you to read more about uh, the, the uh, start of the Cesar Chavez Farmers Movement and how Filipinos were integral to helping uh, fight. And actually, they're actually written out of the history, right? If you look at the, the, the kind of the, if you look at the 
a movie on Cesar Chavez, they don't talk about, you know, the many Filipinos who helped uh, support the farmers and had their own, actually, had their own, like, concurrent kind of, like, um, protest for their farm worker rights. So please uh, go into that book as well. L I really want to recommend this book, uh, America is in the Heart by Carlos Buslan. Very beautiful. Okay. Uh, early Filipino Amer American, Filipino migrant came here, became American and his like very interesting and, and um, poetic life. Okay. All right. From the Plains of Punjab. Okay. Now, I always get a lot of pushback when I teach about South Indians, okay, because I used to teach at Cal Poly Pomona, and Cal Poly Pomona had a huge Hindu population, right, in LA, Hindu, Muslim, um, some Sikhs here and there, but, you know, um, not, not huge, right, but if you, I'm at a new school in Central Valley, and actually huge Punjabi population, right, and so you have an, so 1907, workers from Punjab, Indian, 6,000, India, 6,400 came to the United States, all men again. And they were very, now I want you to pause. And I want you to answer these questions. Okay. So uh, how are these Indians the same and different from other Asian groups? Well, what, 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 eth what gender were they mostly? Males, you're right. And it's so fascinating, particularly if you're from the Central Valley. And I, over the years, I've been teaching for 18 years, and I would get always this mix. I'd always get like Mexicans who are mixed with Indians. And I would say, hey, you know, you're Jose, you know, a very long Indian last name. I'd say, oh, where are you from? He's like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm insert Fresno or, uh, you know, Stockton or something. And I would say, yeah, you're from that group that of Indian, all Indian men who married Mexican women. He's like, yes, my grandmother. And so this is a huge thing. It's so fascinating. And the food is so divine because it's half Mexican, half Indian. And we have this wonderful restaurant, um, you know, curry pizza that you just really can't get other places, it's highly reviewed on Yelp. Okay. And it's because of these groups getting together, right? So actually, some of the Korean men also married Mexican women as well, and they remigrated to LA. Very interesting and beautiful blood. All right, so how are they the same? Mostly men again, and very different is that a lot of these Punjabi men, uh, against the wills of their uh, their family, married Mexican women, right? And so you see the descendants, these like great grandkids and grandkids walking around everywhere, right? And they all say, they all say, I'm this interesting, wonderful mix. Okay, so mostly males status mostly sometimes they already married sometimes not but they would be married in nice states um didn't have they some they had children uh some of them um they were young okay i'd highly recommend that you read this book called the karma of brown folk by vishay prashad wonderful indian american scholar and he'll talk about the situation of current indian americans all right, so it doesn't really talk too much about this, but I really want to go over it um, just because later on uh, we will actually talk more deeply into it. Okay, but I know it's not in this chapter, but I just wanted to include it. So Hmong, Mian, Lao, Cambodian, Vietnamese, um, they also came the result of the 1970s uh, Vietnam War, the secret wars and genocides in their homelands. So lots of wonderful, great books I want to recommend. Uh, Lao Daughters by Bindi Shaw, uh, From Mountain to Skyscraper, The Journey of the Lu Mian by David Se Chow. The Late Comers by Kiao, um, Kiao Ka Liao Yang, and Cambodians in Long Beach, right? Um, the name. What is it? Anyway, I would highly recommend you take a look at these. You can always interlibrary loan them. Uh, really great um, kind of pictorial pictures of, and different perspectives of the Southeast Asian group, which is the most recent arrivals. Last slide. So this chapter talks about Asian Americans, how they're kind of between betwixt, right? Victor Turner has this term called liminality, right? Where Asian Americans, yeah, they're from Asia, and then they're in America, right? And they're Asian Americans, they're Americans, but they're kind of like in this weird between betwixt uh, kind of position. And again, that's kind of like how it's been. And we've been getting all these like new influxes of Asian Americans. And we have this global kind of BTS, like uh, you know, fascination of Asians looking at, Asian Americans looking at Asians. And so it's really fascinating. So I want you to play with that and think of the idea of Asians. Are we kind of like always in between? And that's actually a cool place to be, actually. I think that makes you stronger, right? To see two perspectives. So awesome. Okay. If you have any questions, please email me and I'm here to help you um, with your class questions.